With this, I'd like to welcome you to COVID, the microbiome and probiotics, a review of the evidence and panel discussion. This event is organized by the Alliance for Education on Probiotics, or AEProbio. My name is Dragana skolkovic sanjik and at the Alliance for Education on Probiotics, we work daily to establish probiotics as a first-line therapy for the protection, restoration, and enhancement of human health. We are evidence-based, unbiased, and we are recognized as a global resource for the information on probiotic products. Since 2008, so for many years, we have been compiling, reviewing, and summarizing the evidence that has been published so far on specific probiotic products and associated conditions. Our aim is to provide healthcare professionals with the essential information and tools they need to integrate probiotics in their clinical practice. The overall goal is to enhance the understanding of probiotics, and by doing so, we validate and assert the benefits of probiotics with respect to preservation of medicines, public health dollars, and human resources. With this, uh, I would officially like to start the COVID and microbiome and probiotics discussion. And it is my uh, great honor to thank the um, in companies that are providing unrestricted grants for uh, uh, this particular panel and this event, DSM and Kanika Probiotics have been recognized as the companies that are investing heavily in research, education uh, in this field of probiotics. We are very grateful for their support. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Lin, our moderator for today. Dr. Peter Lin is a director of primary care initiatives at the Canadian Heart Research Center. He's also a contributing author of the Canadian Diabetes Guidelines, especially on the vascular protection section. He's associate direct editor for the Elsevier web portal, Practice Update for Primary Care. And he's health columnist uh, with the CBC TV and radio and has been actively tracking the COVID-19 pandemic and educating about it since the beginning. Uh, he's also been working on virtual care for patients in primary care and he lectures and speaks internationally on various topics and maintains a busy practice in Toronto. As a, a practicing pharmacist in Canada, I would like to thank Dr. Peter Lin for keeping us sane and informed throughout the pandemic. So over to you, Dr. Peter Lin. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for all the work that you've been doing A, as a pharmacist, keeping everything running when us physicians ran away during the beginning of the pandemic uh, and B for putting together this program. And it's really quite amazing the people that you brought together. And I think the questions that we're going to be asking are, are listed here. But the thought is, is that the microbiome, we know that we borrow our friends and they help us, you know, keep us healthy. Uh, we only have so many genetic pieces, 20 some odd thousand genes, but the bacteria and the microbiome help us uh, because they have a huge genome pool in which they can process a lot of things for us. So today we're going to speak specifically about COVID uh, because COVID, even though the news headlines are disappearing, it is still out there. We're now seeing a new version and everything else. And so therefore we have a lot of complications from COVID. So really what we're looking at is we're going to explore the role of probiotics as an intervention in terms of the immune response. Can we help out in the case of uh, COVID-19 patients? We're going to review the existing evidence and to look at the potential uses of this. Can we prevent infections? Can we help manage some of the symptoms? Can we do something about long COVID? So basically we're going to try and understand the problem of COVID uh, and what SARS-CoV-19 has done to many of our bodies, I guess, if you want to talk about it that way, think about potential solutions and how we can collectively share this information and move forward. And really, that's the whole hope of bringing all these experts together today is that we share information and then come out with new knowledge that we can then take um, to our respective practices or personal lives. Uh, we'll achieve this by listening to some experts, four experts that I'll introduce to you uh, uh, shortly. Uh, and then the questions that I want you to have in your mind is what population are we talking about that would have benefit? Number two is what are the benefits and risks that patients, clinicians, healthcare, society would have 
um, in terms of having good treatments in this area in terms of probiotics? And when should be we be thinking about probiotics and for what purposes are we using it for? And what strain or combinations of strains provide the most benefit, et cetera. So in other words, get into the details and then just keep an eye on the gaps of evidence. So where do we still have some uh, missing information? And that would be very good area for us all to look in terms of research. So therefore, there'll be some information that is very practical and perhaps some future information as to where we should take uh, research in terms of what we need to do with our uh, patients with COVID-19. Um, so let me introduce our panelists, and I'm going to go quickly over all four of them. Uh, here we have Dr. Gregor Reed. He likes to be called Gregor. Very, 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 very relaxed fellow, even though he's a giant in this area. Uh, distinguished professor emeritus in microbiology and immunology and surgery at Western University. Scientist, uh, scientist at the Lawson Health Research Institute. Was really the pioneer 40 years plus in the probiotic research area, initially looking at the urogenital tract for women and then expanding to everything else, gut, breast, heart, everything else in terms of microbiome and probiotic effects. He has developed novel probiotic therapies to help people around the world, started a program empowering women in East Africa to produce affordable probiotics in yogurt uh, for hundreds of, of their community people to use. Uh, 32 patents published, uh, almost 600 peer review papers, more probably by now, uh, talks over 654 countries, very sought after. So we're very glad that he's joining us today. Chaired the United Nations and World Health Organization expert panel on probiotics in 2001, has received many awards and was the past president of International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. Uh, so we're really um, happy to have you here with us, Gregor. Uh, next, we have John. Um, he is a physician at Yale um, uh, New Haven Hospital. Uh, John is an ex uh, is extensively experienced in medical education. He's won awards for it. He loves to educate. Um, he is also on the editorial board, review board of Elsevier Clinical Key Med Ed. He is uh, an incoming gastroenterology and hepatology fellow at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, John's research interests include microbiome therapeutics and the role of the microbiota in inflammatory bowel disease and other disorders of gut-brain interaction. Uh, clinical research includes looking at clostridium um, difficile infections during COVID-19 pandemic and other gut-brain interactions. Uh, and he's also uh, on the scientific advisory board uh, for APROBIO. So we're very happy to have you here as our GI panelist. So thank you very much, John. We also have Jordi. Um, Jordi got his PhD in molecular biology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain and was visiting scientists regularly at the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, Jordi is also a co-founder of the biotech company Ability Pharmaceuticals, which is focused on the development on, of oncology treatments. And they have things in phase two trials right now, uh, looking hopeful. And he currently is working as the director of innovations as AB Bio, uh, Bionics, uh, focusing on the development of probiotics. So welcome uh, to you as well, Jordi. And then finally, we have Paul. Paul is a critical care uh, perioperative nutrition physician. So he looks after very sick people. Uh, and he's a professor with tenure of anesthesiology and surgery at Duke University. Uh, he is also associate vice chair of the clinical research in the Department of Anesthesiology and director of nutrition team at Duke University, at Duke Hospital. Paul's clinical and research focus is on helping patients prepare and recover from critical illness and surgery. Currently, he is focused on the role of probiotics in the microbiome and illness, specifically COVID-19 prevention and treatment. Uh, and Paul has had lots of funding from the National Institute of Health and has won many awards and multiple publications in nutrition, critical care, and perioperative care. So basically, we've got four super experts, and we thought what we would do is give them each, let's say, five to eight minutes somewhere in there to sort of talk about this commonality of probiotics, the microbiome. And then what we'll have is question period after that for the rest of the, the time frame. And what you can do is type in your questions into the chat box. I will keep an eye on that and bring those up towards the end. So without wasting any time, uh, Gregor, please uh, tell us a little bit about your probiotic experience and knowledge. Oh, you have to unmute. Sorry, Gregor. We have to say that once in every Zoom meeting. <laughs> Still muted. Uh, still muted right now. Can our tech team send Gregor a message to unmute? Maybe then he can click on that. 
Oh, yeah. there we go. Perfect. I don't know. Um, the, the little icon at the bottom left vanished on me, so I was trying to <laughs> unmute, but there was nothing to unmute. Um, what I did say was that um, I think you've got a great radio voice, Peter. Um, I've got a anyway, face for radio. I think that's what you're trying to say. I have a face for radio. Uh, great voice for radio. So, um, yeah, I consult for Seeds uh, that produces probiotic products, but I'm not talking about them today. So very nice to be here. Uh, hopefully my talk today is... Um, going to be of interest i am clicking to go to the next slide and it's not doing it i'll try again uh, there we go i wanted to start off with the definition of probiotics because um it's much more important than people think and so it's live microorganisms in other words not dead administered in adequate amounts in other words not consumed because it can be uh, applied in many different ways it can a health benefit on the host. Well, how do you prove a health benefit? Well, you have to do studies to prove that there's a health benefit. So I want to emphasize that fermented foods are not probiotics, nor are there probiotics in fermented foods unless specifically added. It's, I find it so frustrating that people come on and they say, oh, yeah, there's lots of probiotics on fermented foods. That's not correct. And they're not inside us unless we've consumed them. And so, again, so many people get this wrong. They say, oh, yeah, we have lots of probiotics and fermented food and, and inside of that. That's not correct. And strains and products must, must be proven to provide a health benefit. Otherwise, they're not a probiotic. So if you took a, if you took a lactobacillus strain and you tested it and it didn't do anything, then it's not a probiotic. So um, please avoid generalizing the term probiotics. Just because warfarin is a drug doesn't mean you take it for a headache, okay? So um, this is, to me, very important. Now, the question is, why did we even think there would be something in this? So this is kind of the background, the theory behind it. The certain strains of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli that have beneficial impact on influenza virus. So that's respiratory tract and obviously a virus. Certain probiotic strains will improve the levels of like interferon, antigen presenting cells, NK cells, systemic mucosal specific antibody in the lungs. Another reason why it might work. Probiotic strains can modify, the, see there you go. Just when I thought the phone would never ring, it rings when, I, when I'm on, that, isn't that the life of Zoom? So, um, so these probiotic strains, certain ones, have, uh, can regulate immunity and uh, help with viral clearance. None of this is COVID, by the way. This is just background. Um, a randomized control trial with one strain of lactobacillus plantarum showed that it can influence pro-inflammatory cytokines. And some of you may know that this was cytokine storms that were killing some patients. And so then uh, that's another rationale. Probiotic strains in, uh, enhance the integrity of tight junctions. So if you can imagine in your gut, you've got these, essentially you want the gut to be nice and tight so that uh, the bad organisms like E. coli don't go into your bloodstream. And so when you have probiotics that can improve those tight junctions, and theoretically you might reduce or prevent the SARS virus from getting in. And then there was evidence against, again, uh, respiratory viruses. So uh, another reason. And lastly, and the gut. So the gut microbiome, people were finding, it was reported in China, people were finding that there was issues with the gut and they wondered how this played a role in, um, in COVID-19. And so there's obviously evidence. So all of that is, is uh, useful. It's, it says potentially they could help. But if, I, if I'm going to pick a probiotic for preventing SARS-CoV, which, which categories would I look at? Well, you might want to improve the, the, the gut barrier function, as I mentioned, but also the lung and the nose brain barrier function, because there's some evidence to suggest that the virus can get through that way. And I enclose this, this anatomy of the vagus nerve. Lots of people talk about the gut brain uh, axis. But in fact, the vagus nerve, as you can see, is linked to a lot of other parts of the body, including the, the lungs, the stomach, the intestinal tract, and other places where bacteria exist. So we have to be careful. We would just uh, think that it's, it's gut brain. We shouldn't reduce inflammatory cascade. 
and increased anti-inflammatory activity. So again, uh, that would be a selection criteria I would look at. And clearly select strains that counter the virus, the viruses that get in the respiratory tract of which COVID is one. So um, then the last part is because we know the virus COVID uh, um, attaches or uses this ACE2, it, um, you could potentially block viral entry. And one thought was you could give milk to uh, when you administer the probiotic. So th these are all good rationale things, but here's something I found very recently. It's a, a nice map, which you can see the, the red and the red says, this is death rate per millions. And the paper was on cabbage and fermented vegetables, imagine. So what they were basically saying was that fermented foods reduce COVID-19 mortality because we had uh, people from Tanzania that kept saying, well, there's hardly any COVID there. Now, people would say, well, that's because you're not testing for it, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, this paper gives a nice, um, a thought-provoking view, I would say, of, of uh, what might be protective with, um, with fermented foods. And in fact, in Europe, they studied country consumption of fermented vegetables and fermented milk and yogurt, et cetera. And each, for each gram per day increase in consumption of fermented vegetables, the mortality risk for COVID was found to decrease by 35%, really quite amazing. So not probiotics, but lactic acid bacteria and uh, beneficial microbes. And, and so I think that that was uh, an, an interesting study. Um, all right, Here, here's again the correlation. You can see it. Uh, the people that are eating the most, uh, this was uh, fermented cabbage, they had death per million was de decreased. So really you wanted to live in Romania or Latvia, I guess. Um, I know from my days in Scotland, we didn't eat much fermented food. Um, we should have though. So um, clicking to go to the next slide, there we go. So I decided to submit a grant. There was a CIHR competition. It said, please submit a grant. Um, it was sort of desperation. They were wanting it in almost immediately. So I thought, well, we could recruit 250 patients. We could split them into an intervention and control. And we would look at the percentage requiring hospitalization, percentage mortality, mean change in clinical status. And um, I thought it was a great study. Um, unfortunately, which often happens to me, CIHR rejected it. In fact, I think I have the highest rejection rate in all of CIHR. Um, and they said that I didn't have an epidemiologist on the ground. Oh, wow, what a big mistake. One study they funded ended up recruiting 17 subjects and they never published the findings. So that was uh, great. And the moral of the story is you only need an epidemiologist to get a grant. But my, my point was that there was a real lack of, of knowledge uh, on this particular panel as to what a probiotics could do. So did any probiotic help with COVID-19? And my colleagues are gonna cover this better than I will, but I'll give you some examples. This is a, a bacillus, a five strains of bacillus. Um, and what they showed here was, this is the time to resolution of all COVID symptoms. And so the orange line is the probiotic group. In other words, uh, people got over the condition quicker. Um, here's another graph. This time it's uh, participants days of fever. And again, uh, fever was reduced by taking the probiotics. And that was published in 2023, so it's uh, very recent. Another paper, this is uh, gut response. What does the evidence show? And um, there was one example here, which I'm, I'm going to illustrate. This is disease recovery was more rapid in the probiotic group. And so but for, you know, getting better quicker isn't such a bad thing. We're not in any way suggesting we're curing uh, COVID or, or, or stopping people from dying. We're just showing that in this case, there is a more rapid uh, remission, which uh, I'm sure a lot of people would rather uh, be back at work than stuck in their bed. <clears throat> a randomized double-blind control trial throat spray. So this is kind of neat. And remember I said, you don't always have to consume a probiotic. This is a throat spray. And uh, the idea was that, that the organisms might prevent 
the ascension into the body by uh, through the, the throat. And so there was three lactobacilli with broad antiviral properties. And I emphasize this because in other words, you, you don't just pick any old strain and try it and say, well, probiotics work or it doesn't work. You need to know why you've picked the strains and what you hope for them to do. And this is what this Belgian group in fact did. And so COVID patients were randomized uh, within 96 hours of a positive uh, diagnosis. And they uh, looked at the analysis and the symptoms were reported daily. Um, and um, there was no added benefit for symptoms in the Verum group. So what they, they found in the end was the acute symptom score. So fever, diarrhea, chills, muscle pain was significantly associated with the uh, the relative abundance of uh, the lactobacilli. So in other words, you know, small trial, is this convincing? Would it convince uh, uh, evidence-based medicine doctor? No. Is there something going on? Yes, I think there is. Statistically, yes, it's relevant. Um, however, um, only giving examples. This is another one, the efficacy of um, treatment of patients with COVID. They, they looked at all the randomized controlled trials uh, that were used for this. The primary outcome was all-cause mortality, which is kind of difficult. I, I don't really expect that uh, to prevent mortality, but this is they found 900 patients were included at non-significantly lower rate of mortality. In other words, this is not a magic bullet. I don't think any of us would claim that it is. I think we're looking to see if it has a place in lowering rates of fever, headache, et cetera. And, and that uh, is where the evidence is. And so that's what they concluded with this uh, analysis. I'm almost done. Um, in summary, I would say there's a strong rationale for probiotic strains to be taken before, during, after the SARS infection. Unfortunately, in Canada, primary health funders do not have a suitable review panel. And I think it needs to change. I think we, this, um, this whole concept of microbiome and beneficial microbes needs a, a major focus in our country um, to find out what, what, what it can do and what it can't do. Um, it's led up to us primarily relying on international centers. And that's what we're going to hear from today from our uh, foreign uh, guests, um, which, which is fine, but it's a pity we don't have more here. And the critical lesson is that probiotic strains have to be selected with specific properties and targeting specific problems. You just don't take any old probiotic and throw it into something and expect it to work. There has to be some rationale uh, for doing that. And post-COVID, you may ask, um, I, this is my final slide, uh, probiotics can prevent neck in premature low birth weight infants. So if you're looking at what, where we should be applying in hospital, I know that some of you work in hospitals. In fact, uh, some hospitals are scared of probiotics entering the building, which is absolutely crazy. We just published a paper showing you can significantly reduce neck. And yet in Canada, I know there's a hospital with a 15% rate of neck, which is to me unacceptable. You can reduce antibiotic associated diarrhea and C. diff infection. Um, some very good data on this. <laughs> There's work in Germany that they give a, a probiotic with some oat fiber and you can improve recovery from surgery. And anyone that's been in a hospital, imagine that you had major surgery and then someone said, oh, we're going to give you this symbiotic. You'd be like, what? You can't do that. And yet uh, no one has gone to Germany and find out why does it work and why should we not be doing it in Canada? And reducing severity, duration of respiratory infections. My recommendation, at least every hospital patient should be receiving one fermented food per day. Uh, and of course that doesn't matter. In terms of long COVID, to be honest, there's little evidence-based data so far. And so I don't wanna say that potentially Depending on gut dysbiosis, mental health, cardiovascular, and respiratory issues, there may be a place for it. But really, we need more data before we can come out and make a statement, unless my colleagues know of something themselves, in which case they'll tell you. And I'm done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gregor. Okay, John, over to you. I think uh, you're you're an expert on dysbiosis, so that, that term popped up there. So uh, turn it over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. 
So I, I think that was a great entry into what I'm going to talk about is, is I'm going to focus on the role of dysbiosis in COVID and, and looking at COVID from multiple aspects, including a, a acute illness, uh, complications of COVID, long COVID, et, et cetera. And uh, so let me see if I have control of the slides. Looks like I do. Alrighty, so uh, just go back for a second. Here are my disclosures, uh, which won't be directly relevant uh, today. So to begin, I just wanted to share these pictures. I began my journey as a physician uh, at the beginning of COVID. And so it was really, I was thrown into the deep end. Day one, I was working in COVID ICUs and COVID floors. This first picture is, is uh, me working in the COVID ICU and the, the picture up top is some of my co-residents and me ringing in the, the new year on uh, New Year's Eve after you know, a, a night working in uh, uh, the COVID ICUs and COVID floors with some of the most critically ill patients in the hospital, many of whom were on mechanical ventilation, some of whom were on uh, ECMO or heart-lung bypass machines. Uh, and so I, I've spent a lot of time treating COVID patients. And then I spend time in an outpatient clinic as well, taking care of the whole spectrum of, of primary care issues. And so I've, I've seen milder COVID cases, and now I take care of COVID in the outpatient setting and, and, and long COVID uh, more and more as we reach the next phases of, of the pandemic. And so I've, I've spent a long time uh, with COVID, thinking about COVID, treating COVID patients. And I, I wanna focus today mainly on, on dysbiosis. And so I'll dive right into this. First of all, dysbiosis, and what I mean by that is really abnormalities of the gut microbiota. So dysbiosis seems to be a feature of COVID-19 in general. So people, when they get infected with SARS-CoV-2, they have changes in their gut microbiota and specific things that, that have consistently come up in the literature that looks at the microbiota of patients with COVID-19 is that there's a reduction in bacterial diversity. And like I always like to say, like in life, diversity in the microbiome is a, is a good thing. It's a very healthy thing. And so COVID patients tend to have a lack of diversity they tend to lack short-chain fatty acid producers. Short-chain fatty acids are metabolites of, of bacteria that produce profoundly anti-inflammatory effects, both, both locally and systemically. These patients tend to have an overgrowth of bad actors, of opportunistic pathogens. They have increased local and systemic inflammation. They have an increased load of fungi, such as candida and aspergillus species, and they tend to have increased intestinal permeability, which allows for the translocation of, of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and their inflammatory mediators into the bloodstream, which reaches then uh, all target organs. Dysbiosis also seems to be related to, number one, susceptibility of COVID-19, and number two, severity. And in order to understand this, we need to look a little bit at, at the molecular biology of what happens in, in COVID infection. Now, we often think of COVID-19 as a primarily respiratory disease, and it certainly is, but the gastrointestinal tract plays an important role in its pathogenesis. As was alluded to before, the ACE2 receptor serves as the viral entry point for the SARS-CoV-2 virions, allowing for local replication and propagation of the infection. Now, ACE2 receptors are expressed in many places throughout the body, but have great density within the gastrointestinal tract. Normally, angiotensin II is the endogenous ligand for the ACE2 receptor. When the ACE2 receptor is blocked by SARS-CoV-2. It allows for an imbalance in the renin angiotensin system that has both local and systemic effects. What tends to happen is there tends to be damage to the vasculature, disruption of the gut epithelial barrier, changes in the microbiota conferring dysbiosis and the things that I mentioned in, in the last slide. Now, the more severe this is, as I mentioned, with the damage to the gut epithelial epithelial barrier, you get translocation of bacterial products that can then affect 
end organs. And in this case, we have the gut-lung axis. And part of this cytokine storm that was alluded to earlier, if you have dysbiosis and the translocation of bacteria and inflammatory mediators in the bloodstream, you can get that inflammatory response to target the lung, where you also have a great density of ACE2 receptors and get the clinical phenotype of severe COVID. So getting pneumonia and infiltrates and pulmonary edema that we saw in the most severe COVID patients. And so because of this, dysbiosis is really a target for potential intervention. If we can improve the gut microbiome for an, a particular individual, we may be able to prevent their ability to be infected by SARS-CoV-2 or at least mitigate the inflammatory response that drives the syndrome of COVID-19. Now, similarly, we have been able to identify through microbiome sequencing studies, there are certain phenotypes that confer protection against severe disease and other phenotypes that increase the risk of severe disease. One example is that depletion of beneficial short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria like F. prausnitzii is uh, correlated with more severe disease. And so this raises the question is if we can augment, say, this particular organism or augment short-chain fatty acid producing organisms in general, can we potentially prevent the progression to severe disease? And this slide says uh, much of the same thing, that dysbiosis increases COVID-19 susceptibility and severity. Now, switching gears to post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, which is commonly known as long COVID, this refers to a wide spectrum of symptomatology that occurs after resolution of an acute COVID infection. And this syndrome takes many different forms. Patients have reported various symptoms, in, including headaches, mental fog, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, persistent dyspnea and exercise intolerance. And it seems to be a very heterogeneous clinical entity. One of the key contributors, particularly it seems in gastrointestinal post-acute COVID syndrome or GI symptoms of long COVID is dysbiosis. So we've been able to identify abnormalities in the microbiota in people who have long COVID. One of the things that appears to be true is that people who develop these chronic symptoms have a lack of microbiome recovery. So other individuals get COVID, get dysbiosis, and then recover from it back to their native microbiota. People with more persistent symptoms appear to have trouble recovering their endogenous microbiota and have thus persistent dysbiosis. They have a decreased diversity and richness of the microbiota. There's an overgrowth of pathogens and a lack of beneficial species. Particular organisms have been implicated in this. Again, we see F. prausnitzii being depleted. Again, this, this being a, a, an anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acid producer. Specific microbiome signatures have also been linked with persistent respiratory symptoms versus neuropsychiatric symptoms. Once again, short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria seem to be protective against long COVID. And then there's, there also seems to be a subset of patients whose ongoing symptoms, including gastrointestinal symptoms, is related to persistent intestinal, uh, the, the persistent presence of SARS-CoV-2 virions within the GI tract. And this here, I've included a histologic section that demonstrates uh, persistence of SARS-CoV-2 virions within the mucosa. So once again, this provides another opportunity that perhaps by targeting this dysbiosis, we may be able to help people recover from COVID quicker and prevent the persistence of symptoms or long COVID. And I include this slide here, particularly the image on the right that shows the, the GI specific symptoms. Again, with COVID affecting the GI tract, a lot of patients are developing these post-COVID gastrointestinal symptoms. It's difficult to estimate how common these symptoms are. A meta-analysis just came out showing that about 4% of 
individuals with COVID will develop persistent symptoms consistent with irritable bowel syndrome. Functional dyspepsia, which is another disorder of gut-brain interaction, seems to also be about 4%. But if you look at GI symptoms as a whole, over 10%, about 12% of people may go on to have chronic symptomatology. So this once again provides an opportunity that we may be able to intervene on. Now, the third aspect that I want to talk about is vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. Obviously, COVID vaccines were the principal discovery that allowed the healthcare system to take control of, of the pandemic. Now, what role could there be of the microbiota in vaccination? Well, there's a, a, an extensive body of literature, mainly in the influenza vaccination research, showing that the microbiota contribute to antibody titer responses. And so the composition of the microbiome can either help or hurt the response to a vaccine, making it either more or less effective. And some of this research has gone on in COVID as well. So Bifidobacterium atalensis, for instance, has been implicated with an increase in neutralizing antibody titers after vaccination and booster. And these antibodies are the protective antibodies that make the vaccines more effective. And so this tells us that we may be able to target the microbiota to augment the effects of COVID vaccines. Similarly, antibody titers have been correlated with other specific bacteria as well. There was a study of inflammatory bowel disease patients, so Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis, disease states that are characterized by dysbiosis. Decreased diversity at baseline was associated with less antibody response after vaccination, and certain bacteria, once again, were associated with better response. Now, something else that, that people often ask about is uh, COVID vaccines can uh, lead to side effects like nausea, local uh, wound pain where the injection was, headaches, fevers, rigors. And so people are often fearful of, of those symptoms and, and wanna prevent them. And it appears that the microbiome also contributes to the likelihood of having side effects associated with the vaccination. And so it appears that increased diversity, increased richness, and specific abundance of specific bacteria seem to be associated with decreased side effects from COVID vaccination. And so again, this, this presents us once again with an opportunity to intervene. So this is my last slide here. So to summarize, dysbiosis seems to play a role in multiple aspects of COVID-19. There is of course the risk of getting COVID, the risk of developing the more severe disease. Dysbiosis may contribute to long COVID and dysbiosis may decrease the likelihood of developing protective antibodies in response to vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. So at each of these stages, we have an opportunity to enrich the microbiota through things like diet and specific probiotics to potentially prevent or mitigate the effects of, of COVID-19, prevent the development of persistent symptoms or long COVID, and augment the effects of COVID vaccination. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much for that dysbiosis and where we're going. Now, do we have Jordy? I see him online. Are we able to have Jordy come and do his presentation? That's great. Welcome, Jordy. Yes, hello. Fantastic. I think you'll have control of the slides. If you click in the center of the slide, you'll have control. George, now you're controlling your slides. Okay. There we go. Okay, there we go. So uh seems that we are running a bit late on time, so I'll try to make it quick. Uh, here my disclosure of conflict of interest for the for today so i work for Kaneka corporation which is one of the sponsors of the of the event uh, and now uh I, I wanted to share with you uh, uh an experience we had uh, of a specific clinical trial in in covid 19. uh i guess you'll remember uh during the first month of the pandemic, there were 
every other day news about this drug could work, this thing could work, that thing could work, someone was trying something. Uh, of course, all of those early trials were observational trials, not randomized trials. And for a reason, it was, I mean, it was a, a nightmarish situation. People were rushing. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we took a, a lesson from that because, you know, having this, okay, yes, it works. No, it may not work. So we say, okay, let's, let's stop and let's try to do something well designed. Let's try to do a randomized, properly blind, placebo controlled trial in, in COVID. And, and to do that, we decided to focus on non hospitalized COVID 19 patients. Uh, the reason why is basically all hospitalized COVID-19 patients we could have access to were already participating in different trials with different uh, molecules. So it, it was impossible to, to have them uh, participate in a probiotic trial. But uh, we thought, okay, there's so many people with COVID who are told to stay at home and they have little more than, you know, acetaminophen to take. Uh, so we think that here is a, a sizable population that could also benefit from probiotics and not just the ones that are in, in hospital. So we decided to focus in this population. We look for patients who were positive for COVID-19 symptoms, but also were positive in a, in a PCR, high sensitive PCR, which had been designed in Berlin for World Health Organization. Uh, and also, we decided to focus on people in the range of 18 to 16 years old who didn't have uh, issues with you know, uh, oxygen saturation because otherwise they, they would rapidly become you know, hospitalized patients. So we wanted to focus on a population that didn't have such a severe COVID. Nevertheless, I have to say that this was the, the hardest research experience I've ever had. So you know, working the study personnel, site personnel, well, all of them overloaded. People were falling ill. The head of the lab doing the, the PCR analysis got COVID himself, had to be intubated. So it was really a nightmare situation, you know, uh, trying to work on the trial meetings at 9, 10, 11 p.m. But nevertheless, we, we went through that and uh, we managed to recruit 300 patients. Most of them completed the study. They were taking this particular probiotic formula here, this strains um, reporting, uh, one Pediococcus acidilectis and three Lactobacillus plantarum strains at 2 billion uh, CFUs per day. For 30 days, we took swabs and blood samples uh, baseline day 15 and day 30. The study population was pretty representative of people having COVID. A median age, 37 years old, half of them were women. 42% had some metabolic risk factors, you know, that could predict a, a worse outcome for COVID, such as diabetes or obesity. And what we saw was that probiotic intervention compared to placebo was able to reduce the viral load as per qPCR. But please notice that the change on day 15 is rather small compared to the change on day 30, it is still significant. This is a logarithmic scale. So every one point reduction means a tenfold reduction, but still the, the effect is much dramatic, much more dramatic on day 13 than on day 15. Uh, we also saw an increase in uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies, both IgM and IgG. And, and here, uh, I think a very interesting detail is the fact that those patients were naive for antibodies for IgG at baseline. So if you see the, the, the baseline value for IgG, which is on the right side, it's uh, something around 10 uh, units milliliter. This is basically around the limit of detection. So 80% um, of the, the patients were negative for IgG. This is a situation we will never encounter again because now, People have been exposed to the virus, people have been exposed to the vaccines. So it's a totally different uh, situation. And it feels a bit odd uh, to, to realize that there was a point where this was totally new and, and we were totally naive regarding uh, our immunity against, against COVID. But nevertheless, the, the probiotic intervention was able to raise the virus-specific antibodies, both IgM and IgG, 
And we also saw a reduction in D-dimer, which is a, a marker of risk of, of thrombosis. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so generally speaking, we saw a very interesting outcomes from the point of view of, uh, of biomarkers. We also saw uh, reduced duration of symptoms compared to placebo. This is something that has also been reported in a recent meta-analysis uh, encompassing more than a thousand patients. Our studies included in this, this meta-analysis, but there are other studies contributing more than 700 patients. And the meta-analysis concludes that, yeah, probiotics can most likely reduce the duration of cough, uh, of headache, of various symptoms of COVID, and not just diarrhea. Diarrhea also can be reduced, but they can probiotics can have also an impact on more systemic symptoms, not just GI-related symptoms. A very interesting observation we made in this trial was that beta interferon was increased uh, compared to placebo during the study. This was not a dramatic increase, so this is not comparable to getting an interferon shot. Uh, this is more like an increase of the baseline levels, uh, but nevertheless, there was a very good correlation between the race in uh, beta interferon and the race in antibodies against the virus. However, there was no correlation uh, between the increase in interferon and the reduction in, in viral load uh, at the end of the, the study. And here, uh, an interesting question that comes to my mind is whether viral load, especially measured as per qPCR, is really a, a good marker of, of live viruses once symptoms are, are gone. We'll remember when we were told that, yeah, we can detect virus on a table, you know, on different surfaces, metal, cardboard, etc. But then it came out that viruses were not active in most of those surfaces after a few hours while they could be detected for days. Because let's remember, a PCR just detects a small stretch of the genetic material of the virus. So even if the, the virus is fragmented, you still could have a, a, a positive. So we have to, to ask uh, ourselves as scientists this, this kind of question. Oh, we see our can be a really good marker on the early infection, but after a, a while, other markets can be more, um, can have more predictive power, it can be more, more accurate. Regarding the, the, the beta interferons, uh, I said this was very interesting because this uh, wealth of previous data showing that uh, good microbiota can influence lung immunity via uh, type one interferons, which include both interferon alpha and interferon beta. This has been studied several times in different labs, different animal models. Uh, and it has also been shown that some, but not all lactic acid bacteria can stimulate the production of uh, these, broadly speaking, type one interference. And, and this would relate to, to previous comment by Professor Ray that said that lactic acid bacteria, but maybe not all lactic acid bacteria can have a, a, an impact on, on, on this type of, of infections. So it has been shown that not all lactic acid bacteria but some of them can stimulate type one interference. And then a, a very interesting detail is the fact that to do so, the lactic acid bacteria need to be uptaken by the immune cells. In other words, they need to be removed from the microbiota. So there's a, a lot of evidence on the relationship between what's in the gut and uh, the possible outcomes of COVID and long COVID that have been presented by colleague panelists so far. But here I would like to bring in the point that it's not just what stays in the microbiota, but also what's taken out of the microbiota that could influence the immune response of the body towards infections such as uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Promise I try to be quick. So this is my last slide. Uh, as takeaway um, and ongoing research questions, we have seen that virus-specific, COVID-specific antibodies can be increased and symptoms can be reduced by specific probiotic, the one that we tested. The type one interference may be involved 
in this effect in COVID-19. And this is analogous to what has been seen in animal models uh, of uh, influenza, uh, that probiotics may have to be eaten, you know, removed from uh, the microbiota to uh, by immune cells to, to provide this beneficial effect. So we could be talking of a death for a greater good, greater good of the host, but also for the microbiota, because if the host stays alive, the microbiota also gets a, a benefit, at least the beneficial bacteria, the, the ones that are uh, mutualistic, that have mutualistic relationship with the host also get a benefit. And uh, last but not least, uh, very recent observations we did in the clinical trial and some uh, animal models that were also running suggest that this probiotic could be helping uh, lung immunity by getting more calm and focused. So we often heard uh, here, sorry, that probiotics are here to boost immunity, but maybe rather than boosting, uh, what we need is not immunity get super active, but rather to act, you know, in a more calm, you know, maybe cold blooded, uh, but focused uh, manner. At least this is what seems from the data that we are gathering for this probiotic. And again, this is work in, in, in progress. So could not be the, the, the case for every probiotic, but this seems to be the case at least for this particular probiotic that we tested. And this is it for my presentation. Thanks for listening. Great, thanks very much. We have a few minutes left before, but Paul, up to you now to, to bring it home. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Um, and you which oh, moving pictures. Yeah, we can see moving. Are you seeing are you seeing two slides at once? Yep, two slides at once. You're Let in the, pre the other presenter mode. mode. Yeah. Didn't do what I wanted it to do. Let me share one more time. I'm not sure why I did that, but I will fix it. Um I want to share desktop one. That's the main. Let's see if this works. Not I will share the huh. other. Okay, let's try again. Nope, oh, did it again. I'll share the other desktop. I'm not sure why it's showing me a different one, but let me fix that. Okay, let's try this one. Okay. Are you seeing one slide? Yep, one slide. Perfect. Perfect. Movement. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So again, I'm going to focus on realistically uh, the time we have uh, a randomized trial we did of uh, lactobacillus GG to prevent uh, COVID-19 in exposed family contacts. And we'll get to that. Um, these are my my disclosures. I like to call them alignments of interest. I'd like to believe the groups I work with, whether it be the NIH, the DOD, or the industry folks, we're all in alignment to improve outcomes and, 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 and get better outcomes for our patients. And so um, but of course, the reality is that we've all been talking about and we all believe that, um, you know, bacteria are often condemned as, as something we should be eradicating. I've been spending the day on ICU rounds prescribing antibiotics to every patient in my unit um, to eradicate bacteria. But I also try to spend a lot of time teaching my residents and fellows that um, really most bacteria are the 100 trillion friends that we didn't know we had and that we really want to keep around. And we should probably be thinking more about prescribing bacteria to our patients perhaps than giving antibiotics in so many cases. And so I think there's lots of fun data for this and, and fascinating interests where you can, you know, learn to even use your own stool. And perhaps if any of us get cancer or other diseases, we should all have a bank of our own stools. The NIH is doing trials in that area and we're getting interested in that as well. And so the idea that we're going to be writing prescriptions for probiotics and or, or the, the gut bacteria that perhaps benefit us, I think is real and is happening now. And so, you know, the question's always been, can we change the microbiome to cure disease or prevent disease? And, in, and is, is what's in our patient's gut putting them at risk or, or putting them um, perhaps um, taking them out of harm's way, honestly, if, if we get it right and if we replace or provide the, the, the right beneficial microbes to our patients? 
And so clearly, I think the story you've been hearing all day is, is one that, that we believe to be true as well, is that probiotics have a perhaps major impact on viral respiratory infections. And we'll talk about that a little more. Um, I too, like Gregor, had a grant that we submitted to the NIH director's grant, which is a large grant that was um, offered during COVID. Um, we too did not get it, uh, unfortunately, but we luckily did get a large grant from an internal Duke microbiome source and, and some support from DSM as well to provide the trial we're going to do. But I think the real issue is I think we were set up for this, this pandemic in many ways. I think the Western diet that, that is, is prominent in much of the world, unfortunately, now um, has deranged our microbiome, the proliferation of antibiotics as children, the fact we don't eat enough dirt when we're small. Um, and then I will tell you, of course, the, the main patients I watched die in the ICU, and I probably watched hundreds of people die, sadly, in the ICU, definitely the most difficult time to be a critical care physician in my entire career of 25 years or more. Many of those patients obviously were aging, they had diabetes, they had obesity, they had complications and comorbidities that we know promote dysbiosis in our patients. And so, and then of course, you've heard about how COVID itself affects the gut microbiome. And so clearly patients were set up to end up in, in our ICUs and my ICU and, and, and for us to unfortunately not be able to save them in many cases or, or have them be very sick and, and suffer long-term consequences as a result. And clearly we know that this dysbiosis, as you've heard, I won't belabor it, promotes this risk of, of adverse outcomes. And so the concept that we promoted was if we can provide a healthy gut flora, and in this case, we used LGG for, for various reasons. I studied it for a long time in my lab, and it's got a large body of data around which it prevents villain-associated pneumonia in the ICU and in other situations. Um, and we very much wanted to see, could we change the risk factors for getting COVID. So the trial I'm going to present, rather than the ones you've heard, is about preventing COVID infection in people who don't have it, as opposed to treating people who already do have it. And so perhaps we could prevent the risk of people getting COVID and having adverse symptoms and adverse outcomes from it. Because really what we're trying to do is restore balance from the deranged diet, the deranged microbiome. I think a lot of our patients come to us with before they start, and perhaps we're able to then resod the lawn by providing probiotics to our patients um, or, or other, other maneuvers like stool transplants or poop pills as the kids from MIT will try to sell you. But nonetheless, I think the idea that we can change the microbiome and prevent disease is, is real. And this is, this is not something that is new. I mean, I think perhaps to my eyes, the most profound and important publication ever in the probiotic field, in this case, a symbiotic field, was the Nature paper that um, Panaki Panagrathi, who's become a good friend of mine, and we talked at length about perhaps doing a COVID trial in India and his sets of trial centers that he still keeps up there. But this trial, if you don't know this trial and you're in the probiotic field, I think you have to know it. It's a large trial um, published five full pages in Nature, one of the highest impact fact journals in the world. Um, randomized trial of lactobacillus plantarum plus fertiligosaccharide in full-term healthy Indian infants. They looked at 4,556 infants and looked at its effect on respiratory infections, sepsis, and all-cause deaths. And they found dramatic reductions in sepsis, respiratory infections, um, and culture negative and culture positive sepsis, likely viral and bacterial sepsis, in these infants and, and significant reduction in primary outcome, 40% um, reduction in the risk of death and sepsis and significant reductions in culture positive and culture negative sepsis and lower respiratory tract, tract infections. Um, there's been meta-analyses of other studies looking at other healthy individuals, adults and kids. Um, th these are large meta-analyses seeing significant reductions in respiratory tract infection incidences and um, both in adults and in children. Uh, again, I think the Cochrane analysis has all shown probiotics reduce risk of respiratory tract infection by 47%. Um, so these are big numbers. A relative risk of length of duration of your respiratory tract infection and your symptoms is as much as reducing it by two days. This meta-analysis was used to do a very impressive economic analysis showing if people all over the world took probiotics um, or in the U.S., in particular, there'd be a massive cost savings um, to, to the healthcare payer of hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, it's extrapolated data, but it's fascinating to do this kind of analysis. 54 million sick days a year from respiratory tract infections. Antibiotic prescriptions would come down by 2 million. Absence for work would go down by 4 million and societal savings could be a billion dollars. And again, these are hypothesized numbers, but this shows you the impact that could be had by a probiotic. And so Again, clinical trials of probiotics we felt were urgently needed in COVID-19 to prevent respiratory tract infections, building on all this evidence we have of its profound effect 
in healthy subjects who have other kinds of respiratory tract infections. So this was the trial we designed. It's called the PROTECT EHC trial, probiotic use to eliminate COVID-19 transmission in exposed household contacts. Um, we started this trial uh, mid-pandemic, about May, June of 2020. Um, we got, of course, registered with clinicaltrials.gov. We got an IND, as we'll mention, for the lactobacillus GG formulation we used. We published a protocol uh, publication on the paper itself, um, working myself with, with uh, Anthony Sung, who's one of our bone marrow transplant physicians who does a lot of microbiome research in cancer. Um, this was what our trial looked like. So initially, if we had a patient that tested positive for COVID in our Duke or outside of Duke population, um, we would contact them and their family members and offer them to be in the study. We randomized people by household. So if you had children or and or adults in your household from basically age one to 99, we would randomize you to either lactobacillus or control. And then we would have you fill out symptom sheets throughout your, your, your first 28 days. And then we check back at 60 days. Um, and we followed symptoms. And then we also got stool and nasal swab collections for microbiome analysis throughout the course of intervention. And again, this was the intervention, lactobacillus GG versus a microcellulose capsule, which is essentially the, the base of what the lactobacillus GG was contained in. And so essentially it was, was a true placebo, in this case, true control. And again, these were the different questionnaires, and I won't belabor the time on them and demographic and time points with which we collected studies uh, questionnaires and samples. Um, this was a fascinating trial to try to recruit for. Um, we called over 6,000 patients at Duke who were tested as COVID positive. We ultimately even spread out to local TV news interviews, Facebook ads, Google ads, and we used a company called TrialFacts to increase recruitment. It was challenging, um, especially as the, the, the vaccines began to become prominent. That was clearly an exclusion. Um, we had hoped to enroll up to 1,000 patients. I'll show you we ended up enrolling about 200, uh, and then we, we stopped enrollment because of the vaccine proliferation, especially uh, amongst where we or live and, and our US population. And of course, we wanted to look at the risk of COVID infection from the baseline microbiome. These are ultimately time points we'll continue to um, analyze now. The effect of probiotics to prevent COVID-19 infection and the effect of COVID-19 on the microbiome and the effect probiotics have on that. So this is the preprint we are, are submitting and we have submitted the paper for, for publication now, but we enrolled 182 subjects. Um, again, with the primary outcome of development of symptoms within 28 days of exposure, we collected stool and we also looked at time to COVID-19 diagnosis and absolute diagnosis of COVID-19 in our subjects as secondary, key secondary outcomes. Um, this is what our enrollment looked like. Um, I'm gonna explain this a little bit because again, when you have a study where you have a household member with COVID, especially before the vaccine, there was always the risk once we randomized you that people would develop symptoms before we got the product. We got the product to patients within 24 to 36 hours by overnight mail. This was all done remotely. Um, and then, so we have a couple of groups. We'll talk about the intention to treat groups, everyone who was randomized, the um, modified intention to treat group was those that started the study product that we had sort of verification from them, they got it and they started it. That group was a slightly smaller. And then there's a group, the asymptomatic intention to treat group that actually reported they were asymptomatic without COVID symptoms when they started the product. And that number was 104. And so our outcomes, um, as you will see, probiotics are associated with statistically significant reductions in COVID-19 symptoms. This was true in every group um, from the pure intention to treat all the way down to the no symptoms of product start. And you can see that that p-value was 0.02 to 0.03 across the board. Um, and then we looked at symptom severity as well. And there were trends there, but I think the key being that the, the symptomatology was, was reduced by LGG administration in these patients. And you can see that was true in each of the groups we studied. And this was statistically significant. Um, the COVID um, probiotics were also associated with a statistically associated, statistically significant reduction in symptoms over time. This was quite significant. Um, this was in the intention to treat group, um, this particular data, uh, and this was true largely across the groups as well. So over time, there was also a statistical reduction in symptomatology that was experienced by the patients over time. And then the other thing that we found very compelling is probiotics were statistically significantly associated with reduction in time to COVID diagnosis. And so the number of patients and the time to their diagnosis with COVID was improved by the administration of a probiotic. And this was in the intention to treat the most rigorous group that we found this signal to be true. And so again, we, we found this very encouraging um, in this group of patients. 
Um, we looked at other outcomes as well. There was trends towards reductions in absolute COVID diagnosis. They weren't statistically significant, so I won't be labor showing the, the, all the other trends that we saw. We did see increases in LGG from the fecal microbiome in the subjects taking LGG. Uh, and so we were able to, in this case, look at the fact that they actually were taking it and it actually was um, able to be detected in their fecal microbiome. And so you can see there were quite some differences uh, and statistical differences in the occurrence of LGG in the fecal microbiome. And then ultimately, we saw changes in the fecal microbiome, which goes beyond the scope of, I think, what we're talking about today. Um, and these were statistically different across the different groups, both in COVID diagnosis, asymptomatic, too symptomatic, and in the treatment groups, but I won't belabor that. I think the key points as I finish is in intention to treat analysis, the most rigorous subject randomized to probiotics had about a 50% reduction in their symptomatology versus placebo, and there was a significant reduction in their time to COVID diagnosis with trends to reductions in absolute numbers of COVID diagnosis as well. And so I think we were encouraged by that. And, and again, we saw significant increases in LGG in the fecal microbiome, and there were significant changes as well. And so as I finish, I think the key here is probiotics, I think, do have a great um, opportunity to reduce and improve outcomes from COVID-19. I think this what you've seen today improves that. Uh, I think the, the end that I always tell my residents and trainees is a healthy gut is a diverse gut. Our diet and other illness, comorbid illness, lead to loss of diversity that associates with poor outcomes and risk of disease, and we need to correct this. And, and again, we live in a microbial world. The majority of the organisms on the earth are microbes. The majority of the organisms in our body are microbes. And we can change that world. And we can prescribe these probiotics to make a difference, resod the lawn, restore balance, and hopefully make it so easy to understand and, and analyze that the children, our kids will be able to do it as well. With that, um, I thank you for the chance to tell you about this. I encourage all of you to follow me on social media. I, I share a lot of microbiome and other GI related data and probiotic data on Instagram and Twitter. And, and it's always great to hear and see the new data that's presented there. And you can feel free to email me for these slides or questions um, that we don't get to today. So thanks very much. And I look forward to the questions. Great. Thanks very much to all four excellent uh, talks. I've been uh, reading in here. There's a lot of thank yous for the information. So I think that's good. We do have a few questions and I think we've we've carved out a bit of time for that. Um, so a couple of questions have been centered around, you know, which one do I buy? Which one do I use? Because there's so many of them out there. What? How do you have a criteria to go? Let's say we're talking about um, uh, post-COVID IBS was one of the questions. So you got GI symptom post-COVID what what do we do? Are we going to analyze our stools? Do we just go ahead and buy something? What What's the thing that we should be getting? Uh, because there are so many things out there on the shelf. So anybody can take a crack at it. Just unmute your microphone and go. John, you want to take a shot at that one? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. Um, so as, as has emerged as an important theme, each probiotic is different. And so we have to tailor our probiotic choice to what we're actually trying to treat. So when it comes to post-COVID irritable bowel syndrome or post-COVID gastrointestinal symptoms, we unfortunately don't have much data at this point to guide our, our selection to say this probiotic or the, this mix of, of probiotic strains uh, helps post-COVID IBS. And so my practice taking care of a lot of IBS patients at baseline is to apply the IBS literature around the microbiome and probiotics to those patients. And so I'm using probiotics that have been shown to be beneficial in IBS and post-infectious IBS to patients with post-COVID IBS. And so you can check out the AE ProBio Clinical Guide to Probiotics to help guide selection with IBS and lots of other conditions. And then I also shared here in the chat, a crowdsourced clinical review that Dragana and I did with uh, in collaboration with the GI Journal Club and uh, Tuesday Night IBS Forum. Okay, any other thoughts about how to select? Because I think that's probably the top question that we keep seeing, you know, so we need to be selective. As, as Gregor was saying, you can't just use warfarin to treat your headache. So how do we match those things up? Are there sort of set of symptoms that you might have where we could look up a table and, and match across? Is there something like that? Well, I, I think the, uh, the the probioticchart.ca or usprobioticguide.com are both very helpful. I would much rather go there than, than ask uh, someone in a health food shop because they tend to give you what they have been told is a good product. And unfortunately, too many products are, are produced by just throwing a bunch of strains in and, and then uh, it, it sounds all good in theory. 
but you really need to know what those strains can do and therefore you need to pick it and unfortunately uh, you, the system does not allow us to put things on the label uh, mm -hmm. that would guide people and and that's because of the regulatory system which is out of date but um, that means that people have to go to PubMed and of course not everybody's willing to go to PubMed and then you know to interpret a PubMed paper it's very difficult so I guess the guides are at the moment the best way to do it uh, unless you know more and more physicians are becoming knowledgeable in this subject and just like John you know if you went to someone like him he would give you a, a, a good answer right and at the end of the day if it's a clinical problem you do need to get an MD's uh, input Okay. All right. That's good. Uh, a, couple, a couple of questions about immunocompromised patients. Um, are they okay to take probiotics? We're always afraid of giving them live vaccines and things like that. Any issues uh, with a person that's immunocompromised, for example? Yeah, so I answered that on the chat line, Peter, because um, I, I don't think we can come out with a blanket statement and say, oh yeah, probiotics are safe for everybody that's immunosuppressed. It depends on what it is they're immunosuppressed with. It depends if they, uh, the patient's condition, uh, leaky gut, uh, et cetera. And, but in, uh, in a paper that we published a few years ago, um, we looked at at risk of so cancer patients and HIV at the time was quite uh, prevalent. And, and so there are probiotic strains that you can give safely to those uh, patients. But again, um, you have to re really do a bit more digging than just say, oh, yes, I'm Im immune suppressed. Therefore, I'm going to go to the local store and buy any old probiotic. You shouldn't be doing that because at the end of the day, you know, these are live organisms. They, they can cause infections in us. Um, I mean, there have been rare cases, but, you, you know, we, we, we don't want to be making blanket statements that all probiotics are safe or all probiotics are safe in everybody. You have to be careful what you're doing, but it, it, we know that in Africa, with a lot of HIV patients, they were helped by the probiotic yoga that they took. So, I mean, um, I think there's some good cases. Very great. Uh, a couple of questions here about celiac disease. So people with bowel not related to COVID, um, any kind of recommendation about the dysbiosis that might be going on there in celiac disease in particular? Any takers of... Uh... Celiac. I can, I can tackle that. Go ahead. Thanks, John. Uh, so celiac disease is an autoimmune disease that is driven by autoimmunity against peptides in wheat. And really the only treatment at this point is a gluten-free diet. So you remove the trigger, you, you remove the aberrant immune response that's driving the intestinal inflammation that contributes to the dysbiosis. And so Really, the, the main, most important treatment is, is the removal of, of gluten. Now, there are patients who go on to have persistent symptoms, and th there's many reasons as to why this may be. The most common is, is non-adherence with the strict gluten-free diet. There's often cross-contamination, particularly when you're eating out at restaurants or if things aren't labeled correctly. But with any GI disorder that features gastrointestinal inflammation, there's also the risk of sensitizing the very sensitive nerves in the gut that lead to what essentially becomes irritable bowel syndrome. We see this in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. We see it in celiac disease. And so we have to think of those patients once we exclude active celiac disease as treating them for whatever disorder they have, be it irritable bowel syndrome, functional dyspepsia, et cetera, and uh, targeting the treatment of whatever is driving their gastrointestinal symptoms. Great. A uh, couple of questions about uh, the dose. In other words, how much? You know, a lot of times it'll be mega dose. They'll put big numbers. Um, what is the dosing and do the bacteria survive the acid going through? Do they have to be in special capsules or anything like that? So any thoughts about that as people are sort of wandering the halls of these, uh, the products that they're really looking for? Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, I hate to say it's kind of a North American thing that just because it's bigger, it means it must be better. And that's nonsense. Uh, you need to look at what the clinical data is telling you. If you if you need a billion organisms and it works in a human trial, then that's all you need. Uh, and so more isn't necessarily better. And I think that, the, unfortunately, too, not too many companies do dose studies. Mm. We did that for 2000 or a long time ago, too, too long ago to remember, um, where we looked at 
do you need to give more or less? So that that's uh, again, I think uh, something people have to make sure they they don't get conned into taking something because there's twenty billion. You know, it's, that's not what's important. The dose should be the dose that yeah. works. All right, that's great. Um, may I bring in some additional comment in here? Uh, we also did a, a clinical trial some years ago in IBS. We tested two doses, so there was placebo group, then a dose of 3 billion and a dose of 12 billion. Both doses work the same. So we have to understand that there may be a saturation effect. And once you reach a saturation effect, a higher dose doesn't bring in any benefit, just more expensive, but doesn't bring any additional clinical benefits. So there's a, the, the dose response is normal, it's not a line, you know, it's more yeah, like an it's like S. <laughs> so <laughs> you have a region where at the bottom, you change the dose and you don't see any effect. Then you start seeing some effect that increases with the dose, but then you reach a saturation. And again, when you increase the dose beyond that, do you, you don't see any more of an effect. This happens with probiotic. We have seen, there's not many dose response trial, but there's a few. We have performed a trial and, and we saw exactly that. And, and happens with many biological situations, many biological molecules. So uh, there's no reason to think that probiotics, probiotics are gonna work different. So yeah, once you reach the, the maximum dose that has been shown to work in a clinical trial, getting a higher dose is just paying more for the same effect probably. Same effect, okay. All right, to reinforce so this one last time, each probiotic is different. And so we can't generalize. Uh, each probiotic may require a, a different type of dosing. Some will require refrigeration, others won't. Some will have better survivability in stomach acid and, and others won't. And so we really can't generalize across the board and have to look at what the studies showed uh, to guide our clinical usage. Okay. And, uh, and question. Think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I think you could see that in our, our clinical trial of, of, of COVID prevention, that we could increase LGG in the stool of the patients um, via microbiome analysis, HCNS analysis. And so clearly the bacteria were getting to the colon and getting to the, getting to the distal gut, um, despite the stomach acid and other things. So it is making through because a lot of people believe the stomach definitely, acid wipes definitely everything out. So. No, no, no. Okay. Um, and and not just that. I I, I can't say from from Panaki's experience in the India to the trial in India. The, one of the reasons he chose lactobacillus plantarum, and um, one of the reasons we chose lactobacillus GG is he was able to show, and we've shown this in the lab as well, preservation and colonization of the gut of the colon with mm -hmm. lactobacillus species. Um, and so you can get long lasting colonization with lactobacillus species. That's, that's the reason he, one of the big reasons and some of our data from lactobacillus and its effect on, on immune function, um, was the reason he chose that for that large trial in India that was in nature. And that's one of the reasons we chose LGG for our probiotic intervention trial for COVID is we know it gets to the colon. We know it can colonize. Um, and, and again, we were able to show it in patients at home who were trying to prevent COVID and, and he was able to show it in his background research as well. Peter, you, you raise a good point about viability because um, it, it, it should be end of shelf life viable numbers. And some companies unfortunately don't do that. And so therefore you may be buying dead bacteria. Um, there are also bacteria that can resist stomach acid and bile that can help the numbers get down. There's also technology where the capsules don't dissolve until they've passed the, the stomach and bile. So again, um, it, it unfortunately needs a little bit more research for a, a person to, to see which of those products are suitable because not all of them are. Great. Uh, I think we have time for two questions, if you don't mind. One is, are there any bad side effects? Like I think people are thinking about bacterial overgrowth. Are we going to create any of those scenarios? That's the first question. Let's deal with that one. Are there any downsides uh, uh, that you've seen that we have to be aware of as we start on this uh, probiotic adventure? I'll touch on it quickly in our study. There were actually significantly less adverse events in the probiotic group versus the control group had significantly more GI related events, likely due to the fact more of them got COVID and had COVID related symptoms. But we had a stopping criteria for adverse GI side effects that patients, people could stop. Mm -hmm. There were significantly more adverse effects in the non 
probiotic control group than there were the probiotic group. So we that's didn't good. see that in healthy patients. Of course, we, we can talk about the colonization that's been reported in the literature in sick infants and in sick older people. There are small numbers. I'm sure others could comment on it as well. Um, but but we didn't see that. And, you know, the um, HRQ did a huge 650 page report a couple of years ago looking sure they were going to find adverse effects of probiotics. And they in 652 studies, or I think that was the number 652 studies, they didn't find any, even studies that went on for a year, mm -hmm. increase in adverse events or risks to subjects, some of many of whom were acutely ill. So they looked at those trials as well. The only exception to that, that that was noted was the trial that was done in the Netherlands where they gave probiotics to pancreatitis patients, um, where they gave a symbiotic and a probiotic as a post-pyloric delivery for those that work in the hospital. Um, they were on the other side of the stomach sphincter and the small bowel, and a significant increased number of the patients who got the probiotic fiber combination got ischemic bowel disease and had increased mortality because they the, what happened was the probiotic and the fiber would hold on, hold the on. It would stop and stop moving and it would cause ischemic right. bowel because patients have poor mortality so i i would strongly advise people that work in the hospital from ever giving probiotics in a post pyloric tube where you can't measure if the gut's working where if you give them to the stomach if the gut's not working, they'll come back out as residual or patients will vomit them up. Yeah, they never proved that the probiotic caused the problem. And why, I, did, why I you... did talk to the surgeons who operated on those patients, though. And what you could see was there were fiber balls on the other side of the feeding tube um, that that seemed to be problematic. And again, it's not the probiotics fault or the fibers fault. What had happened was it was poor motility and poor trial design. There were also ethical issues with that trial. They, they disobeyed their stopping rules and were called to question on many other ethical issues. But um, talking to a couple of surgeons who operated on those patients, there were a few of those patients that definitely had where, the, where nothing moved and, and they were sitting on their side of the feeding tube. And so I think as long as you don't give probiotics post pylorically, that's the only trial that anyone's ever seen where there were meaningful adverse uh, events. And that was because of the rotted delivery and, and, and sort of not thinking through the patient population. There's an excellent paper published by ISAP recently that looked at this question of the safety of probiotics and looking at potential safety outcomes. And so I do want to echo that overwhelmingly, it seems that probiotics are a safe intervention. But like anything else, there are, of, of course, the potential risks for rare side effects. And we already mentioned the potential of translocation leading to uh, bacteremia and sepsis that occurs very rarely. And then there's also sort of a growing concern about the potential for the spreading of antibiotic resistance genes from a probiotic strain to the endogenous microbiota and, and what effects that might have uh, with respect to antibiotic resistance down the road. Uh, so that there are still a lot of outstanding questions about the long-term uh, safety of, of probiotics. Um, and so I encourage you to read this, this ISAP uh, report that very eloquently talks about the, the literature and addresses uh, where we are with these concerns. Is that on isapscience.org? Is that, that what you mean by ISAP paper, or are you talking about a publication? No, th this, was, this was published. I'm sure it's on the website somewhere, but it's it's uh, published. I'm actually going to summarize it in my next AE ProBio Research Review. So you, you could also uh, wait, for, wait for that. But it, it, it's a, it, it was a, a publication that was a result of a, a discussion in the ISAP uh, yeah. annual meeting. That's great. I, I think our time is up. We still see some questions rolling in. So uh, what this means is that we need another one of these sessions. So I think I think the the appetite is there. I think we will probably organize. Uh, but thank you all very much, uh, John, Paul, uh, Gregor, uh, Jordy. It was fantastic. You gave us good information. The discussion was great. The panelists, uh, fantastic answering the questions. And the questions were fantastic coming from the audience. So we really appreciate the audience participation. Uh, let me just turn things back to our, our, our sponsors and our, and our organizers for some final last words and maybe a hint that maybe we'll be doing this again very soon. So again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm I'm um, amazed. I always learn something new uh, from from this uh, uh, panel. Uh, I'm so honored to have had uh, all of you uh, as as uh, uh, you know guests here to share your amazing knowledge. Uh, so what I like to also thank the uh, Alliance for Educational Probiotics for organizing, putting us all together. And again, for all of you staying on longer, we still have more than 100 people listening to us talking. So obviously, there's a lot of appetite 
for the education in this field. And we are lucky to have such a great educators experts on board uh, today with us. I'd like to thank DSM and Kanika Probiotics for enabling us to organize this event. Um, you know, very great uh, uh, to, to work with the companies that have invested in education and research. I do encourage you to, as many of you mentioned, to follow the AProBio, go to aprobio.com, subscribe. Dr. Damianos is our regular contributor to our quarterly uh, updates we publish to look at what's new in research. Um, and uh, at the end, you'll get the, uh, when you sign out, you'll get the question to help us plan the next uh, events and to help uh, you know see how is the best to answer your questions. Um, I uh, cannot say thank you enough, Dr. Peter Lin, Dr. Reed, Dr. Bishmeyer, Dr. Damianos, Dr. Espedre Mazo. Uh, I learned so much and I do thank you from the bottom of my heart for staying on longer and working through our bit of a technical difficulties we experienced today as always. Um, and with that, uh, we will uh, stop recording the session. If any of you likes to stay longer and engage with participants, that's fine. But this is the end of our official session.